Well, welcome everybody to a new episode of the Art Business Podcast. Um, I have a very special guest today, an artist, um, Jack Davis. Uh, Jack was, well, welcome Jack. Hi there, welcome. Um, Jack was, uh, Jack has always lived in the south of England and particularly the southwest, which as you will see becomes appropriate to the work uh, that he makes. Um, he he very much sort of um, grew up uh, in Bath in his in his early childhood, and um, he was born in 1990. By the way, uh, I would describe him. I guess one would describe him as an ultra contemporary artist. Uh, <laughs> I don't know whether Jack would agree with that, but that that would be my categorization from like what we do on our art business courses and so on. We unfortunately we have tendencies to categorize people and ultra contemporary, I, I think it's quite exciting actually. I think I think it oh, suits okay. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, now, just very briefly, because listeners will be able to look at your a more complete biography um, online, but your first group show was in the Chapel Road Gallery in Bath in 2008. Yeah, yeah, I, I exhibited mostly in my early career in Bath, I was in the summer exhibition in the Royal Victoria Gallery in Bath as well. And then that led to the Chapel Arts Gallery as well, which was just um, a local curator trying to help influence, you know, and support young artists. That's great. So from an early age, I was very keen to try and exhibit and, and get my work out there because it's it's all good making it in the studio, but no one sees it in the studio. You've got to, you've got to take it outside. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's a good good attitude. I think it's an attitude that we're seeing more and more from ultra contemporary artists who realise that, you know, they've got to make a living as well as and, and well on a good level, get their work out to the world rather than kind of just sit on it without no understanding, you know, of marketing, etc. Um, and, and just sort of rewinding a little, I guess, presumably that followed. Oh, no, you were you must have been. If you were born in 1990, you would have been 18 then. So were you about to go to art school in Falmouth? Yeah, yeah that was that was pre pre art school. So I was very dedicated from the age of 16. I, wow. I knew that what no matter what I was just going to do, I sort of I had my first heartbreak. <laughs> and so oh. it put me into, you know, a rocky phase and I found painting from it. So that really taught me that, you know, your challenging moments can become your most successful endeavours. And it was really, that was the launch pad. And, and then, yeah, so from 16, I'm now 32, almost 33. So half my life, I've been basically at the studio, in the studio every day, painting. And it's, yeah, really can't do anything else, <laughs> but, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> Brilliant. And um, just a quick, just a quick interruption, I guess, of this intro, um, because I might forget to ask it later. Was the work you did for, say that, group show first group show in Bath in 2008 is that did it have any bear any similarity to what we see behind you which is the work that you've recently been doing which we'll come back to yeah so I, I initially started painting plein air out in my I grew up in a little village called Kumhe near Bath and it's got this beautiful little river and fields and so I would after school go down to the river at the time my favorite influences were Turner, Monet and so I was really trying to you know get that impressionist sense of light and yeah found this little river and so it was really that that started my my fascination of painting was there was a Kurt Jackson exhibition at the Royal Victoria Gallery and I was just really interested how the mark making was create you know abstract mark making can create a, a visual representation or image and then you relate it back to like pixels it's okay it's it's all just a trick of the eye and so I think from that show, it really gave me an understanding of how paintings are an illusion of space. And, and that is very interesting, how a two-dimensional object can give the illusion of, of space. And, and yeah, so I really I started with a more like traditional plein air style impressionist. And then when, when, when I went to Falmouth, I was sort of <laughs> steered away from painting. And, I was and gonna very, ask you about <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was very much, uh, they, they were very keen on contemporary sculpture, conceptual yes. work, which is great, but it, yeah, I, I say so then I was really keen, when I was at university, I learned technical skills, so I learned how to weld, how to make moulds, and was more focused on sculpture, because 
you can teach those techniques, whereas painting, it's sort of, you can teach certain applications of paint, but you can't necessarily teach you how to paint. <laughs> that, that I feel is, is, you know, you've got to learn yourself. Absolutely. And, um, so yeah, so I, I, at university, I was interested in how I could turn a, a two-dimensional surface and, and twist it and bend it. So I was making sculptures that were quite immediate. So I was trying to take that same Im impressionist, you know, spontaneous mark making and translated into into sculpture where I was bending metal spontaneously. I then, you know, got to a stage where I moved studios. I changed, yeah, my thoughts on just have I fulfilled what I can do with <laughs> bending a piece of metal? Because there's only so much I, I could do with that before you start having to involve very serious technology and just, yeah, I didn't, didn't have access to it. So I went back to my roots after university, which was painting and and painting outside and being connected with the landscape and it was yeah it was just finding that authentic voice it took me a while I had lots of conversations lots of you know trials and errors I went down lots of dead ends but eventually I got to a point where I just you know F it <laughs> I'll do what I want I don't care if other people like it and, th and that was a real turning point with my work it's when I, I was making it for me and no that's, one else. That's in, that's really interesting because I think that um, my experience of your work, um, viewers of the YouTube, the video version can see this fantastic seascape. I guess I call it rather than landscape behind, um, which we're going to talk about later. But that I I I mean I think that I think that some people in the art world might see your work as oh it's not intellectual enough it's not clever enough uh, all what I would say to listeners now is that it is so stunning in terms of the 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 just the you can see uh, the, the beauty of the landscape and it's not like a photographic image it is full of emotion and I think it's full of what what you Jack refer to as mark making so I think you're very much living in the contemporary world with groups of artists who increasingly and they're they're being very successful on the art market as well you know increasingly people are wanting something more uh, I, I don't like the word traditional but it's a kind of it's more of a kind of take a riff on tradition if you like and we'll come back to that later on because I know one of your main influences you already said is Turner so I think we'll come back to that that where you're positioned in that overall world I'm just gonna I'm just gonna kind of complete the um the kind of intro as it were because it's uh we we went off at a slight tangent there so so I just wanted to say that your first group show though for it was at the age of 18 even before you go to Falmouth uh, for your bachelor's of arts degree in fine art um in 2008 and then you have your first solo show um at the Octagon in Bath, which any of the yeah. listeners who've been to Bath will know is one of those wonderful sort of Georgian Jane Austen Association rooms. Yeah. That William was in Herschel 2011. There, uh, you know, the astronomer William Herschel. Yes. He used to play the organ in that room because it used to be a private chapel. And also Jane Austen used to go there. So it's an incredible historic building. And that was during my, I think it was my second, my, after my first or second year of university. I'd, I basically, I, I had two lives at university. I had my studio at, at, you know, on campus that I made sculpture in. And then I had a second studio under my bedroom that I'd make landscape paintings in. So I was always bridging <laughs> these two. And so in the summer, I was like, right, I'm, I'm going to, you know, no one's going to create opportunities for me. I have to create them myself. So, so I hired the building and, and did the marketing and took a leap of faith in myself. <laughs> you know, at the time, I spent my life savings on, on the whole show. And um, but it, it paid off and, and I was able to sell paintings. And then from that, it just really gave me the belief that I can do it. And yeah, I was able to travel and it just really, yeah, gave me the belief that I could do it. <laughs> and so did you have to rent the Octagon? Hmm. And, and that yeah. was for how many weeks? I think that was for two or three weeks. So I was yep. literally there manning it. I, I did the whole thing. I really? rented it put it up I, I was in the space every single day I spoke and greeted to every customer wow. <laughs> like it was yeah it was, it was and you and you sold you sold some works yeah I did it, it did really well like my when when my work is put in front of people it, it does really well it was always a challenge getting the galleries to put it in front of people so yeah. that's why I, I you know in the early days I, I bypassed them and did it myself the same thing applied in St Ives I 
there was the Crypt Gallery, uh, which is again very historic part of the British modernist movement. And um, I was struggling to get into galleries in St. Ives. And so I was like, right, I'm just going to rent that space and do what I was doing in Bath. And I had, you know, extremely successful exhibitions from it, which then led to, to meeting the wonderful gallery that I work with now, Livingston St. Ives. So in 2011, just that's quite interesting because that's 11 years, 11, 12 years ago now. Um, there was already developing social media. Um, what, how did you market that show? Yeah, that was at the time. I was probably quite late to social media. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't get Facebook until I went. I was over eighteen. You Same know, here. so <laughs> that cross cross generation of grew it growing up without the internet, and then, but at, at quite a young age, you know, it, it's crossed upon you. So it was mainly local ma ma uh, magazines and local press. So it was very old school, actually, like right. traditional. And then when it was empty, I, I would stand outside the door and, and invite people to see my artwork. It was <laughs> absolutely really get in and come and come and have a look. You know, don't, and, and, and do you do you still it. think like analog marketing and being there in person? Do you still think that's very important for an artist, even if they now? Add, as you do, and uh, you know, Alicia Livingston is pretty good at it. You, you you put stuff out on Instagram and and so on as well. So would you would you say that all of those things together are important for a, an emerging artist to advertise themselves? I think so. Yeah, I, I I really do think so because it's so just having lots of followers on social media doesn't necessarily mean lots of sales, and it's you still need I think um, the grassroots you know, developing through local galleries. And I don't know, if there may be a few shortcuts, but I, I don't know of them. <laughs> I, I just think it's persistence and persistence. I think but so. It, Go on, sorry. Yeah, it's just about um, being approachable, I guess. Like in the yeah. early days, I had lots of open studios and it's, I, I used to tutor at the Newland School of Art. So I, it's just bringing awareness to yourself is, is, is very, very important because yeah, if, I, I make work in isolation <laughs> and yeah. don't have that many, you know, social encounters. <laughs> so Absolutely. it's just studio. So you've got to find ways of either yourself or other people helping, helping spread, spread the word. And when I speak to art collectors, I don't think I've ever met one other than you get the occasional one is only in it for investment. I hate them. <laughs> yeah. I shouldn't say that in my program, but I think my students, most of my students would agree with that. You can do both basically. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, they 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 like to know the artist and to be able to talk to them at private views. You know, that is part of a relationship. And I think it's a very, very healthy relationship. It's really it's about um, being being friends, isn't it? It's you, you're making connections. It's like the galleries I work with, you're, you're friends with them foremost. And then from there, a, a you know, a business relationship develops. Yes. I've, you know, I've left galleries in the past because there's not that, you know, mutual, oh, I'd want to actually sit down and have a talk with you and feel like they've got your best interest at heart. So, yeah, it's, uh, it takes a while to find your right place and, and everything. But once you get there, it's 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 really nice. Oh, and just coming back to your first solo show at the Octagon um, mm. in 2011, I noticed it was titled People and Places. So did yeah. it have, you know, many would describe you as a as more of a figurative artist than an abstract artist though I would challenge that we'll come to that later on um, but it was called people and places were there figures in those works because I haven't seen any of them no uh, yeah that was I was um combining sculpture and paintings in that show so it was really about how like my response to a place so people and, and the places so I was taking rocks and then casting them and arranging them and creating sort of ready-made compositions but yeah from objects I had recreated if that makes sense but and then from that I just switched well after Australia because I went over to Australia to exhibit uh, my sculptures so I did quite a lot of sculpture but then I, yeah I just my love and passion is is painting it's I think it's the immediacy that, that I was able to get with it but I think yeah I'm, I'm I generally I don't paint people like I most of my compositions are devoid of human presence. Sure. It's, I think I'm the human in the landscape, so I'm trying to portray my emotions. So you're seeing an internal lens, if, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, and one of your 
heroes, if I can call them that, in the artistic tradition is Turner, who even in his big landscapes, there's usually some, some little person or boat or something. We'll come back to that later on, because it seems to me that you're, you're you, you know, I haven't seen any boats or people in the works I've seen of yours. No boats, <laughs> that's my warm rule. <laughs> <laughs> and no, no little red boys touched in at the last yeah. moment. As, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so you spoke about making sufficient funds from the Octagon show in 2011 to enable you to travel. And I think I was going to ask you, um, you then go to Australia to Bondi Beach. I've never been to Australia, but obviously Bondi Beach, all the listeners will know that iconic sort of surf beach, I think. And um, I th do you surf? I think you do. Yeah, I used, to, I used to surf quite a lot. I then nearly drowned a couple of times, which <laughs> lets you off. So I, I do prefer the water. I prefer the sea from the land, if that makes well, sense. Was that... Did you nearly drown in Australia or in in Cornwall? No, yeah, Agnes around here. And Agnes down in Cornwall. Because you you get like consistent sets, but then every so often you get a big set come in. So the day it was around four or five foot, you know, which is which is my capabilities. But then a quarter wave got caught in the breaker zone, and then a big set of like eight nine footers came in and Scary. just what means me. And you're like, what am I doing? Like, yeah. <laughs> like you know, so <laughs> I remember uh, just a little personal note linked to that. When I was at school, well, I think we were about 12, <laughs> our school took us on one of these adventure things down in South Wales where we did potholing, which was, you know, they didn't test us for claustrophobia. There were kids screaming, oh, and, yeah, yeah, you know, no, no health and safety rules in those days. But three of us nearly drowned at Butte, including me. Yeah, um, and one of my best friends actually we thought he'd gone and he was uh, a helicopter had to come in and take him to Barnstable and it was in all the papers yeah. <laughs> so that that made me very very careful about rip tides which we were totally unaware of we were told nothing about tides when we went there things have changed now as you know it's just such a that's what I get from the sea is you're confronted and humbled and it, it's it's so powerful you can't it's uncomprehensible you know it's and it's so vast when you think how it spreads across our globe and most of the planet is water and it's just this and simmering energy it's oh yeah <laughs> i think yeah, we're yeah. just attracted to it i don't we? know whether you i don't know whether you ever watch the tv probably not but i i watched attenborough's new series on on wild island i think it's called it's about britain for once so yeah. it's really it's really beautiful because it's really nice to see how beautiful um, you know the British Isles are and he started with the sea up in Scotland and orcas killer whales you know the the usual hunting of seals but um, that that what came across in that is again how how much coastline we have in in, yeah. in Great Britain how beautiful it is and how vast it is you know um, so so Bondi Beach you were making sculptures as I understand it and did they stand on plane were they actually on the beach in open air yeah, that was a real challenge. So, because I went, I moved over to Australia to to make the work, and it took about three, four months of fabrication. It was a real challenge because I had to obviously fund it myself. So, I'd get up at five o'clock, travel, get on a bus, go across to the other side of Sydney, work on a building site as a labourer in the heat <laughs> for all day, and then come back at five o'clock, go to the other side of Sydney, go to near the airport, and then. Um, where yeah and into an address to your unit and where I've been put in contact with a, an incredible painter because I was using automotive paint finishes to with the work that I was that I was making but yeah the because of the health and safety and the restrictions they I had to end up encasing it in a in a perspex box which was the right call because I was sort of <laughs> probably a bit out of my depth for like a public exhibition in a new country you know I, I pushed my my skill limit to the maximum and um which I was so I learned a lot from it but artistically I wasn't necessarily happy with with the results but I but it, it you know it was a very good experience and I learned a lot from it was but, there any interest did anyone buy or yeah, I, so I so you had large sculptures and small sculptures so I, I just sold everything which was great right. Yeah, and so I was to main to mainly Australian buyers, collectors. Yeah, yeah, Australian buyers. Yeah, yeah. It was, it's an incredible exhibition. Like when you're on the when I was on the airplane going over there, there was adverts for it. They you know they closed the road down. Wow. Um, last year, the year before me, Anthony Cairo was our exhibitor. Wow. 
you know, you, you got, yeah, you got treated incredibly fantastic. It's, it's an, an amazing exhibition. And that was a group it, show, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's from Bondi to Cottesloe, which is like a coastal path yep. just from one beach to the next as, as such. Is it Cottesloe? No, sorry. Bondi to Tamarama. Cottesloe okay. in Perth, which was the other exhibition that I was in. So after, yeah, the, the Bondi one, I then had a break and I... I moved to this crazy town in the middle of nowhere in the mountains called Nimbin and it's, it's like founded in the 60s with the age of Aquarius so it was very <laughs> like very very hippie um you know my type of place <laughs> just yeah. very secluded from society it feels a little bit like Cornwall in a way you're just like left to your own devices and yeah so I lived there for a little bit I ended up living um with a dog whisperer and <laughs> rescued a dog and he then flew back with me and so I got a dog while I was in Australia which fantastic yeah. was it one of those loveliest Australian border collies he he's got a bit wait Winston oh he's still there yeah yeah he's got a bit of <laughs> he's got a bit of Labrador a bit, a bit of everything in him Winston come on people um I have a, a a smallish border collie she's actually in the room asleep at the moment called Drift after we bought her at Drifts which you, you'll know the little hamlet yeah yeah, yeah. I know yeah okay, 30. um just before lockdown we suddenly realized something's going to happen let's we, we just lost a a, 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 a a border collie called Kelt and we we were missing her so we we found this amazing freehold that sold these beautiful border collies like working um yeah so yeah no anyway so there's what what's what's his name uh winston <laughs> winston beautiful yeah he's the best studio dog he's so docile <laughs> <laughs> yeah you need that um yeah my, by the way my dog sometimes she'll come up and start playing with a squeaky toy so i hope she i hope she just stays asleep at the <laughs> oh no it's good and and dogs are again they're, they're so good for getting out and seeing nature i find you know it's it forces you out that's it it's like good boy like rain or shine um yeah. you you have to get out and so that's it's yeah it's been a blessing it's yeah. also my bargain to, I said if I get a dog I can never get a real job I've always got to pursue my art and yes. so it, it was my ultimatum that no matter what this is it and so <laughs> I went <laughs> for it. Yeah, and it's been true you know ever since I've had him I've never had to have any you know part-time job or anything so it worked. <laughs> that's that, that's worked really well. It's beautiful that you were able to bring him back because that can be quite difficult. Yeah, no, he came straight from Australia. It's really simple. He, he came straight back and he's now been on an aeroplane, a train, a boat. He just needs the underground. He just needs to go on a hot air balloon and he's he's done everything. <laughs> <or Anna's favorite. laughs> There's plenty of hot air balloons down in the West Country that you see. Yeah, yeah especially around Bath, actually. There's quite a few. Yeah. Probably pretty dangerous to have one over where we're going to talk about in a moment where you're living at the moment but just to complete this sort of mini bio I noticed that you then went to New York and you had a, a you had a show um at the NYC gallery this what that what I didn't actually attend it was okay that was a competition that I was in and okay. it was so my sculptures won a competition and so I was able to yeah put them in there and I see. so really great but I, I wasn't able to attend at the, at the time and so it was quite a temporary exhibition yeah um and and then you some of the awards you've won that you won the Aesthetica prize for a hundred contemporary artists yeah I was yeah you were I was nominated and put in their award book so I had a they chose a hundred people from from the that applied and um again that was for my sculpture and I was sort of oh, making and metal sculptures and um yeah so it was from I was really just building my just trying to get as many opportunities as, as possible and then recently I haven't I've actually just started entering competitions again because I you they're funny <laughs> you know sometimes you're like oh why do I bother and so <laughs> yeah, I've started doing it again well what one of my earlier guests um the is a a, a, a Ghanaian born London based artist called Kojo Marfo and he he actually put a work in pretty much at random in fact he told me that he didn't want to enter it and his girlfriend entered for him yeah and then he gets this phone call saying we'd like to show you we shortlisted you I was on the panel for that and um yeah so and that was during lockdown 
It's called Isolation Mastered, where they're asking people to put in works that they were making during lockdowns. And then everyone so liked his work that um, he had a solo show after that in J.D. Mallet in London, which really boosted okay. his reputation. I, I know the work. Yeah, I know. The yeah, work. he's fantastic. And he's another one who then made some amazing sculptures. Uh, which one of which was standing in the street in May in Bond Street in Mayfair during their kind of London Art Week. So yeah, they, that was an interesting experience. <laughs> yeah, collections can be that real. It, again, it's uh, enabling a, a new audience, isn't it? In the yeah, yeah. But it's another example, I think, of galleries working together with artists. Um, JD's very sympathetic to to to, to his artists and. Um, introduce them to collectors and it's that triangular relationship which is a traditional one and I don't think it's going to go away in spite of no. some artists saying that they can cut out the middlemen the middle people yeah, exactly and I, I think they they actually provide a, a really nice buffer like as an artist you want to just focus on creating the work rather than the ins and outs and minutias and and also like money like you don't want to be thinking of yeah. you know my very value to a painting it's just I just want to paint what I want and, and you know yeah and yeah. so I, I galleries are so vital um for providing that buffer <laughs> and also that that connection it's I, I especially with you know new technologies I really think the gallery model is so old and established it's very difficult to to change that and mm -hmm. so I it could maybe be enhanced by new technologies but I because it's you're buying a physical object and like you say that the story of the creator is so intertwined and I just don't see how you can separate that with, with I, 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 I think it would also be a very boring art world if one you know I, I wouldn't see much point in living in London actually I mean one of the things that keeps me here rather than moving out to where you are is is just I just can't give up going to see art being made in galleries and meeting collectors and artists it's such fun you were talking about the society when you're when you're in an otherwise quite lonely situation so um you know I, 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 it's a good thing, I think. I, another prize that you won, I think, was the See Me Global Arts. What what was that? Yeah, that was um, related to the New York one as well. That was the same competition thing. I see. So they moved from one city to the, to the next. Moved into another, yeah. Um, and then, um, the, this is how I came to know your work. Um, Alyssa Livingston, who is a, a gallerist that I work with in St Ives when I take my students down to St Ives, and she was just so welcoming to us as a group and a neighbor, uh, over two years now she's enabled my students like to hang works and last time yeah. they were even they were even marketing it and having private views and it was up for sale and I remember uh, they had a choice of works which each we had we had something like six seven groups um I don't think you were around at the time but quite a lot of my students chose your work <laughs> and yeah. um, they also we gave them kind of fictional budgets and they had to go out and um, like buy £20,000 worth of work each of them but they then had to tell us what they bought so that we could give a prize to the gallery that kind of made the most money <laughs> um, which is ridiculous but I, I, I you know your works were doing were, were very they they loved your work, which is good because the average age of my students is 24, 25. So I think that I think as these new collectors come into the art world, there's a lot of signs even at the very high end of the art market that millennials and Gen Z uh, are getting mm -hmm. more money and they're very interested in collecting art and they're interested in collecting it for life's, you know, for good reasons, not just for investment. So I think it's quite good news that my younger students are, yeah, are very, yeah, very happy about that. <laughs> and yeah, I'm really happy because I've had a recent show in London with Alicia and yes and St Ives and I and because I've, I've done very well in Cornwall and I was always you know your concerns like oh is it going to do well in, in London but it it had a really really positive response and yeah it could go back to what you were talking about previously about how my work is you know could be seen as traditional but like you said I would say that they're, they're all they're that borderline between abstraction and, and figuration and so hopefully I'm I'm able to offer something that the the eyes and the soul like you know I, I always think I, I make visual art and you should be able to appreciate it with your eyes first and foremost and then you can bring your own personal you know experiences to it I, I don't want to over you know at university I was always it's basically a philosophy degree and they tell you to think of this complex you know minute problem that's only in your head uh, whereas now it's uh, yeah 
you're able to just provide aesthetically pleasing works because a lot of my process because I'm working from studies and memory you you're able to control you know what I create and so I'm not just cop I never work from photographs I never just paint a photo I don't see the point in that for me um yeah so it's just it's just really sorry I went on a bit of tangent <laughs> no 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 that's no, it's very interesting because I'm thinking of people I, I was thinking of artists that are really well known now you know beginning to you know established international artists in international collections etc cetera, etc cetera. I think of people like Peter Doig and <clears throat> some of the things I love about your work I love getting I love paint brush strokes and what you might call mark making we might talk about what you mean by that personally in a minute um but Doig of course famously uses these often quite tacky touristy Canadian postcards and then he creates yeah. these magnificent oil paintings from the postcard that introduces that element of intellectuality and inverted commas into it which I guess he would say and his collectors and dealers would say that's what makes it art and that's why MoMA will have his works and so on um and I I just I find that a slightly artificial way of looking at art because all the qualities that are in the surface of a Doig painting I don't want to you might feel I don't want to compare you too much with Peter Doig but the things that I find I'm looking at and my my senses enjoy I, there's almost a, a physical aspect I think to looking at, at brush strokes that kind of chimes in my head it's not just my sight it seems to chime through the body and uh, you know when I look at his work and then I look at your work and that's what I like in it but that's a very personal thing well I think paintings are really special in that way I I you know you you think while you're painting and to me I think a, a time machine paintings are time machines because they're linking you to that moment when they're created and they reverberate and resonate and yeah the, it's the marks you're 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 finding a piece of moment and space and time and it's resonating so I, I love Doig's work um oh good yeah it's, yeah it's really really that's interesting really to know I think he's got a show on at Courtauld in London at the moment, which I haven't been to yet, but I'm planning to go. There's another, um, I would say, someone along those lines that's come really big out of St. Ives is Danny Fox. Like, yes. he sort of encapsulates a little bit of those aesthetics. And yeah, there, he's again, really love his work. It's, it's very interesting. So, Jack, talking about St. Ives, we haven't spoken about it yet, but one of my questions was, you, I think you've spoken about the kind of areas you were practicing in before you located to to the end of Cornwall, which for listeners, the very end of Cornwall is a, a region called West Penwith. I, I suspect that's not the original Cornish name. You might know that, but we call it West Penwith. And um, it's it's basically an area of land, I guess, from the very well-known seaside resort, but art colony, St Ives on the north coast. Am I right in saying probably Western through there is this area called West Penwith and you currently live in St Just, which is between St Ives and Land's End. Um, in a, in a, it's lots of tin mines along there, all that archaeology is, is, is present. Do you want to, what is it about West Pen, West Penwith that you like? <laughs> why do, why do yeah. you like to work down there? It's a really special place. Number one, the remoteness. It's, you know, you're very isolated, so you're able to just get on, get on with painting. And there's also a really magical quality of light because you've got just the expanse of the ocean one side, and then you've you've got like the rest of the mainland blocked off by some hills. So you just feel like you're in this isolated sliver between St. Ives and, La and Land's End, where you've got these incredible patchwork fields for the Bronze Age structures that are still used as fields. And it just there's got there's a primal majesty to to the place. It it feels like I've been here before, and and you know when you look at all the Neolithic monuments that are around, who knows maybe thousands of years ago, you know my DNA was here before. <laughs> so it, you just yeah, it's a really magical place. It just feels very primal and and a whole other world away from from the rest of the country you know it, you just feel like a, on, a, on a little island and this is actually when you do feel like you live on an island and um yeah I, I just love the the remoteness of it it's it doesn't get too busy in the summer although it does but it's not too too hectic 
But um, yeah, a lot of artists like Peter Lanyon was really inspired by work uh, by the coastline. He would take his hanger up, um, glider up and, and, you know, it's, yeah, there's just something about it that seems to attract artists. Even, even now there's like this little, Alicia calls it the golden triangle. You know, we're all just sort of like in this little, little area. One, one reason could be, you know, when I moved here, it was how can I get the most space for, for the funds that I had? And so I was able to acquire an old Sunday school. So it's a nice big open building with incredible light where that's, and so I live and work in the, in the same building for the last five, seven years now. So it's no escape, <laughs> it's just 24 <24/7. laughs> seven. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the um, yeah, that golden triangle thing is quite interesting because I, I guess his, for the listeners, historically, my, all my students will know this because we took them there, but historically, I guess the story of, of modern art in that area began not in St. Ives, but arguably across the peninsula on the south at Newlyn, where you've yeah. taught. You, yeah. I think that was in the late 19th century. And you can see work by a lot of those artists in the Penley Gallery in Penzance. Yeah. It's these genre scenes of fishing on, you know, fishermen on the beach. Um, yeah, and then so it moves, moves across to St. Ives. Yeah. Yeah. So I've lived in St. Ives, Newlyn, and now here. So I've sort of done the <laughs> all of them, basically. <laughs> And you can see the merits for each ones. Um, like Newlyn is on Mount Bay, so you get the most incredible sunrises. And again, the light is is very special. Also, from a geographical standpoint, you can understand why it's a harbour because it's really tucked in. And so, just from going across to Newlyn, which is about seven miles from me, the weather can be dramatically different. I can have mist and and wind and you know chaos and, and they can have a little tranquil pocket of sunshine on the on the, you know seven miles away it's a real microclimate it's um, yeah, when i when i go down there with the family in fact we're hopefully going in may down to senon and um another good surf beach and um when the weather's bad there we just get in the car and drive we don't like getting in the car but we just drive over and it's sunny in penzance and newlyn yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, amazing how it does just change like that. Senon again is one of my favorite beaches for painting, especially when the tide goes out and you get the wet sands, the sky reflecting on it. There's, yeah, it's a real, real special place. Yeah, when I when I was at university, I, I walked most of the Cornish coast path. Um, oh. in, in those days, <laughs> it was pretty remote. You, you know, nowadays you see a lot more people and it's, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of corrosion of the path. Mm. But, then you didn't meet anyone I was wild camping and I, I remember I remember I still have memories of of coming from where you are in St Just um and then and then suddenly seeing this amazingly beautiful golden bay ahead of me the tide was out and that was Senin Cove and it's really changed a lot you know there's all these trendy cafes now and it, it just wasn't like that then I think there was one cafe but the beach I remember still being incredibly beautiful that whole coastline from where you are onwards is incredibly beautiful yeah, I've, I've still, you know, I'm lucky and I've been able to travel around a fair bit and I've still never really encountered anywhere quite as special as it. So it's it's very humbling being able to actually live live in such an inspiring environment. Absolutely. So um, you have a an Instagram um, platform, which I will put the links uh, in, in for, for, for listeners. Uh, and and um, it has a really good piece of film of you painting on the coast in, en plein air, in the open air, as you say, in the tradition of Turner and Monet. What I was going to say is, what's the difference between painting from memory or photographs in the studio? You partly answered this maybe earlier, and painting en plein air. What is, say a little bit more about the excitement of en plein air. Yeah, well, so en plein air, it's so immediate, and the, you, you, it's the wind. It's, <laughs> it's the wind, it's the elements, it's everything. So it naturally makes your, your mark making and your brush strokes so much quicker. You don't have time to contemplate so much. When I'm working in the studio, you know, you make a few marks, you step back, you, it's, it's very sort of almost, um, you know, methodical and, and ritualistic. Whereas on the, when you're plein air, it's just a, a frantic scramble. <laughs> and then you see but, what you've got at the end. <laughs> 
it sounds as though you enjoy both practices um and, and what i mean that painting behind you um for, for listeners we were speaking about it before we started recording you can probably see it's a diptych that line line running down the, the center of jack's head is actually it's two separate canvases and you can see it's pretty large jack jack will talk more about this but he started making larger work um and obviously that is something you're not going to do on plein air so could you talk about the process of making a painting like that yeah, so these larger ones that I create in the studio, this one's one meter 50 by one meter 50. So there's two of them so by three meters. And I, I really am enjoying going up in scale because what I really love about painting in plein air is the your full body movement. It's not just, uh, you know, flicking the wrist and you're making a, a nice little pretty painting. It's you're you're throwing your whole energy into it. And so the same with these large ones, you can, it's about the movement that you're getting into it. You're really like wrestling with the materials, the mark making. So you're trying to emulate that sort of ferocious storm within your mark making. And then uh, with a lot of the time, I sort of transition from dark to light because I like this idea of from what you know created my paintings was going for a struggle and coming out of it and you get, get the light. So I, I really try and use light as a subject matter and as a metaphor. And yeah, the yep. scale just really enhances that because I want it to take and encapsulate your whole vision. So when you see them, it's like you're you're in the landscape, especially when you're walking along the coast, you get these moments of sublime light and it's like a, a religious experience. You know, the clouds move, there's the light comes down and it, I want to try and capture that sense of like optimism and, and hope in, in my work. And, yeah, I just feel like you, you need to be able to stand, they need to embody your, your whole vision. And so, yeah, I'm really enjoying working large. I was able to really make my largest works during my residency at the Port Mere Studios. And so those ones were two meters tall by three meters to 20. Again, they were a dip tip, so they're made out of two should, panels. Shall we share one of them for the yeah, viewers? Yeah, I think there's uh, Requiem or yeah. uh, Symphony. Okay, so this is Requiem. Um, in Porthmere Studio Number Five, and Jack, tell us for listeners like my students. Some of my students visited. We went on a tour of the studios, but Studio Number Five is an important one at Porthmere Studios, which which is near Tate in St Ives. I haven't spoken about that yet. Overlooking the the best surf beach, I think, in St Ives. Um, yeah. So, do you want to talk about Studio Number Five and your experience of working there? Yeah, it's such a magical place. It's I think it's been used by lots of different artists throughout the like you know decades like uh patrick heron and uh i know rothko was there very briefly maybe even uh, i think francis bacon was there for a little bit so it, when you walk in there you you can even still see their notes on the wall for shopping that they need to get and so it, there's there's a real sense of history but it's it's like yeah reverberating around you and then you, even on a this is this when when this photo was taken it was a very light day but even when it was overcast you'd still have this real sense of glowing uh yeah space to work in so that it was just so liberating to have all that space and be right in St Ives so you could you would step out the studio be at the beach I love going up to it's called the island and there's like a little chapel on there St Nicholas's chapel and then from behind there you can just you get this vista of, of the of the ocean and you'd get these storms rolling in at sunset. So you, you'd just, you know, fill your mind with what was happening outside. And then you'd run back into the studio and translate it. This particular painting has got like a, it's got lots of layers. And I started with a sort of burnt umber, sienna, burnt sienna and was it red ochre. And then, cause I was trying to get, I was trying to emulate the layers like the sun. So you have this sort of pinky bits po uh, poking through and yes, yeah, so you apply paint, you wipe it off and you can really start to see some of the impasto marks here where I, so I'm using a palette knife, a really large palette knife. I'm using brushes. And so, yeah, I want areas of thick impasto marks and I want areas that are smoother so your eye can sort of focus on certain areas and not be overwhelmed so I always want a balance of texture so it's not there's not too much going on and that's, I think my palette is also fairly restricted because I'm trying to 
focus on the mark making rather than just being distracted by color. Fantastic. I'll, let's just, um, um, where are we? I'll just, just need to get back to the main screen. Sorry. That's okay. Um, Um, yeah, it's really this again. This piece has recently been acquired, so it's really nice to know that you know my large scale paintings they they do find homes as well. And it, I'm I'm finding that it's actually my large works that are finding the most homes. So it's really encouraging when what you love doing is also what is you know the audience also loves. And I think you can't. There's yeah, you've got to make authentic work, and and immediately it it can be it can be seen and, and valued when it's got that authenticity. I think when you talk about those, the larger scale works as well, and you talk about wanting to embrace the viewer in the work, it, it reminds me of those, those sort of panoramic paintings that they used to put. I think even from the 18th century, there are these stories in London of an amazing space. I think it might've been an octagon in, in Regent's Park. Right. Um, where, where, where the artists, um, I can't remember if it, people like Turner were involved, but they would deliberately put paintings of landscapes around a room, like yeah. on, in an octagon. So that, that, that probably is an octagon where they've got probably seven paintings and then an entrance and they have curtains and you go in there and they darken the room and then they open all the curtains wow. and light it. And you're, you're immersed, you know, we talk about immersive art today. Yeah. They were already doing it in the 18th and 19th centuries. Yeah, no, that's incredible. I need to, I need to look into that. that well, yeah, I need my references, but I, definitely these places existed. Um, yeah. Did you? We have some other works of yours, Jack. Did you want to talk? Do you want to show? Should we share some more? And you can talk about yeah, the process. Um, yeah, so, which one would you like to look at? I've got. Could be a good one. Which one? A symphony. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So I'll show that. I think I've got that in. Hawthmere Studio as well. Yeah, there it is. I'm not certain I've actually downloaded the, um, you know, larger That's version, but you can talk about it. The viewers can see what's going yeah, on. This one is Requiem. Symphony has got a, like a dash of orange. Oh, sorry. Did you want Symphony? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Apologies. Let's just go to that again. So it's Symphony you want. Yeah. There we go. Is that the one? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, because with the, because I'm sort of, these are my skyscapes. So, because I'm based in a, an old Sunday school, the windows are positioned so you can only see the sky. So it's, it's really like my main, main subject matter. And what I really like is how it starts to become almost mountainous and ambiguous. So by, by taking away the horizon, what I've done is I've actually used the bottom of the canvas as imagining that's the horizon. So this is a stormy sunset. You get the little peak of like, you know, illuminated sky behind the clouds. And then this is where it's like that transition between abstraction and figuration, because you could, you could read it as, as an abstract painting, but then you could also read it as a, as a figurative painting. And I, I, I like the idea of making, you know, you don't want to be spoon fed because then it's just too easy. You want to look at it every day and find something new and keep exploring it. Yeah, and um, the, the titles of your works are, are interesting. I know the one behind you, you, you haven't titled yet. Presumably it is an actual location, the one behind you, or doesn't that matter to you? The, the actual location that I, I really, I try and make them fairly neutral when I title them. Interesting. So I don't, sometimes I put the place name in, but other times I keep it more of an emotional feeling because mm -hmm. I want the viewer to be able to relate it to their experience. Because if you put it as a, oh, this is there, then yeah. it, it completely shuts off all their experiences of other, you know, other coastal areas. And yeah. so I like the idea that it's quite open and allows the viewer to impart their their meaning into it. Yeah, and of course, a very well-known artist who worked in St. Ives um, was Barbara Hepworth. And I think it about the titles of her works as a modernist sculptor. Um, so yeah, there's that one actually over the, you know, by the coach, by the bus station in St. Ives called Epidavrus, which is 
I find that very evocative and poetic because it, if you've been to the ancient Greek theatre Epidaphrus in Greece, you can see what she's done is just taken the emotion of being there, I think. There's perhaps little bits of references to the kind of semicircular auditorium and everything, but generally speaking, I think she's saying, this is what it feels like to be at Epidaphrus to me, but the work is kind of quite an abstract work. So yeah. it, I think it's quite interesting that some of the works you actually call things like Porthmere, uh, which the, the, the beach, which is just below these studios, um, but others are like, so symphony, we haven't talked about music. Do you, is music important to you or do you listen to it while you work as some painters do or do you prefer not to? I'm more of a podcast person, to be honest, when I'm walking, when I'm working. I like just, you know, being in your head and, but I do listen to music as well. This one's symphony because it's, it's like the end of the day and everything's coming into a crescendo and it, it's all the, you know, every, all the conditions are aligning together to create this, this beautiful sort of magical moment. So this that's where there's a title for this one came from. It's really trying to reflect that that emotional connection. Yeah. Um, no, I, I find titles really interesting. I get quite frustrated as someone who's kind of more interested in classical antiquities and like old masters, as they're still called, um, when they when, when it's obvious that they've got a modern title. And I think the modern title can be misleading. Uh, mm. that we give to works if we know that they are, you know, we have no idea that what the artist called it, if they called it anything indeed. We have this kind of fetish for having to title stuff. But I think I think in, you know, modernism and postmodernism and contemporary art, I think the titles can be very poetic references. Yeah. Like yeah. And then yeah. Requiem, I guess, is another maybe alluding to, you know, we think of musical Requiems, but it has other poetic undercurrents of Requiem for the Dead, yeah, yeah, that was, again, and it puts in like how I was in my life personally, I'd just gone for a breakup. So you were just in this, you know, quite emotional state. So yeah, you always try and I always look at them. And, and it's, it's really about the feeling, what do I what do I get from it? And, and then and then it sort of dictates the, the title. But I do think they, they are quite important because I like, yeah, and then this is a very, very recent one this is called emboldened. And again, I'm trying to it's it's taken so many years to paint what I would consider like non-romanticized sunsets because sunsets are this it, I'm almost you know it's a, a yucky it can be very cliched chocolate box but I'm trying to create these more dramatic sunsets because especially here on the West Penn Whiff you just you've just got open ocean and then you get these incredible storms that roll in and so I really like these I call them skyscapes, but then when you look at them, they can become headlands, moorland, you know, they're really up for interpretation, but I, I really want them to be like primordial and really try and reflect the landscape that I inhabit. And I feel this one does it quite, quite nicely. And, and again, this yeah, no, no I, I, I know, again, to my eyes, this look, you know, relatively speaking, this looks, this could be an abstract work in many ways, mm. compared to say the work behind you, which I think the first obvious thing is, this is a beautiful seascape with the light sparkling on the waves. There's a there's a typical Western left to right direction of emotion with the storm in the left-hand part of the diptych becoming after the storm in the right-hand side. Um, it's kind of narrative in, in it to a certain extent, whereas this one arguably is more of a beautiful aesthetic, kind of uh, abstract experience one might say or could be <laughs> yeah and it's just really again these ones you're just trying to because I was painting my what I was doing before which was the sea and the sky like the one behind me and then it got to a point where I just was loving the skies so I was like why don't I just isolate that and it's gonna liberate me massively and so yeah I've been really enjoying making making those new ones because it just gives you so they're more challenging though to make because there's not a set, oh, this is what it is. You know, there's a lot more room for interpretation. And so they're, they're actually a lot more challenging, which is which is quite interesting because you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't, I don't think you have to tell us who aren't artists. It's, uh, yeah, I, and well, again, I, I think the work yeah. behind you, um, one of the things in a, a, that I've seen in a lot of your work chat is that this, and I remember having a conversation with the students who had one of your works on display in the St Ives Arts Club, just opposite um, Liv the, the Livingston Gallery down there. Um, they had a little show in there. It's quite a difficult space, actually. 
Um, and uh, they had one of your works there. I can't quite remember the name, but it has lots of this glistening light, which is something that we see when we're on that Cornish coast path, you know. Yeah, uh, you just get this, those moments. And I'm, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm trying to like recreate and allow that special tiny glimpsing, you know, fleeting moment if it can live on. And, and that's that's what I'm trying to do. And it's, yeah, I think this, this that's why I was, uh, before us like the seascapes they're very technically accomplished in a way so I, yeah. you would think that they're harder but it's actually the skyscapes that are, i find more challenging because there's no like definition definite this is when it's when it's done and um, but yeah and going back to i think you're talking about like classical antiquities i always think of these these skyscapes they always feel like arenas for yes. and you can really emphasize like where the greeks you know their gods came from like the, the god of thunder and yeah <laughs> it's primeval is yeah all of those gods yeah. you can get and and you know aphrodite venus rising from the waves of the sea when she's born it's all there yeah, it, it, it really gives you it's hard to get yeah it really gives you adrenaline you know at the moment there's a storm going on outside and it's like oh I'm, I'm hunkered down it's it's you can feel it blowing it's you feel alive that's what i love about and also because yeah there's a lot of I think like you're saying in, in landscape painting it could be seen as traditional so I, I really try and steer away from the, the rare blue skies that we get and 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 paint more of the storm more of the rain and so hopefully I'm trying to reflect a, a more authentic view of, of the landscape. Yeah and the, the the other thing that comes to my mind when I'm looking at this is <laughs> it seems very remote but you know Canaletto's ability to paint the white sparkling light on the Ven on the Venetian lagoons and Grand Canal. You see passages of your paintings that are just like that, but then we realise that we're in this deep sort of off, off Britain, rough Atlantic Ocean with all mm. the dynamics you spoke about. So over here, for example, that just, that's what I look, that's what you're looking at when you're a surfer, that you're looking for this kind of flat white water, which is often dangerous. It's like a rip tie. It, it, I may be wrong with that, but, that, but you've got a whole mixture of textures in your sea, which I, I think is brilliant you know it's not just one one surface it's all sorts of things going on in that sea and in the sky yeah yeah it's it, the the thickness out of the paint varies dramatically throughout the work like the the foreground's quite a thin paint uh, yeah quite a thin wash that i use like a rag and brushes and then you build it up in in layers and different marks also size of marks like yes you start with your biggest marks in the foreground going to, to smaller marks which gives the illusion of perspective absolutely so there's a lot, of, a lot of like just technical also generally like i've got heavier textured areas at the bottom and then leading to a lighter smoother area at the top so you, do you do you use linen as a medium as a base it's a mixture uh, so some of the smaller ones are on canvas and yes. then they come in like roll sizes so, for example, emboldens that is on linen because it's uh, yeah I need to to go up and I actually I really like linen because it's more you glide your brush like glides over the yeah. surface whereas cotton it sort of gets clogged up in the pores and it's not as meditative really it's yeah so I'd, they're hard to stretch linen but it's it's it is worth it yeah and um, is it it's acrylic that you're using. I, I use oil. That's right. I've made that mistake before. I thought it was oil. Yeah. yeah. So, can you just say why? Any, you know, why do you prefer oil to acrylic? Because a lot of content, a lot of artists I speak to, they say oh, it dries much more quickly. Acrylic. Um, yeah. I I just like the sort of surface qualities of oil, and yes. there's it just behaves different. It just yeah. behaves differently. Yeah. You've also got more leeway because it doesn't dry so quickly. You know, yeah. you can can leave paintings for a day or two and go oh no I, I could change that and, and yeah. you're able to go back into it whereas acrylic it's also you know over time will acrylics be here in a thousand yeah. years you don't you know a hundred <laughs> years who knows but we know a oil painters point. yeah so I generally use um Michael Harding oils I'm quite conscious to try and like reduce my carbon footprint with my work yeah. I try and source my material from Belgium for the linen and then Michael Harding oils that are made in Britain. So I don't want to be flying stuff. stuff That's over. good. 
we do a lot and, on sustainability in our program yeah. <laughs> and it's really it's for also for you know conservation reasons as well it's about yep. I'm, I'm trying to use the best materials possible so my work will outlive me <laughs> that's always yeah. been my priority <laughs> have your cake and eat it so yeah. just um just to conclude jack um you had your first shows with Alyssa Livingston Gallery St Ives um, in 2021, The New Horizons. There were two shows, because I think the first one was so successful. You put on another one called New Horizons, which is an obvious title for your work. And you've got a forthcoming show called Cornish Light, again in Alicia Livingston St Ives. Um, yeah. Do you just want to say a few words about that? And I know that I think yeah. the painting behind you might be in it and some of the ones we've shown might yeah. be in it. In the show, yeah. And um, so, yeah, this this new body of work, Cornish Light I've been working on now for the last eight months or so. So it's um, really an exploration over the more wintry months that we get and just trying to get that organic elemental feeling through through the work. I've also, these ones have been going up in scale. So I'm trying to, yeah, really present new works that are larger as well than before. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be my first solo exhibition in their new gallery space because before they, they had an old gallery space and so we've got a new one so it's going to be really exciting to we're going to go in and um organize the curation so i've made you know i generally try and make work to to fit together because i feel i i made a big step forward when i stopped thinking of works in isolation and you know seeing them as a one one continuous body of work and so it's it's yeah, it's going to be really nice to hang the hang that all together. But it's, it's really much, it's a much bigger space than the old one in Fourth Street, yeah. so that enables yeah. you to use bigger paintings. Exactly, and it's got a real sort of flow around it, so I can have some paint. Yeah, I've got sections, and it's just going to be a, a really great. I've already had collectors come um, that are going to be coming down, especially for mm -hmm. it. So it's just so humbling when because I always you know you make this in isolation and you think painting is a is a self I used to think it was a selfish endeavor and and then you know when I meet people and they're buying paintings because it reminds them maybe of a struggle in their life or someone they loved and there's it's actually such a personal human to human connection it yeah it's made me realize that my painting isn't selfish <laughs> that's great <laughs> and, and, I'm doing it this. <laughs> and do you have any idea of the opening Hmm. Date? Yes, so it's the opening night is uh, the 6th of April, and so the general opening will be the 7th of April. It will run, I believe, until the 21st of April in the main gallery space, and then we're moving it to a second space for part two, which will be by the uh, St. Ives Society of Artists. So it will be, we generally do two part shows over the Easter period, after because yeah, the last one, it worked so well, and it seems to be a time where a lot of people come down over the Easter period. So it just gives that chance for everyone to see it. Do you know when this, the one at St Ives Site of Artists finishes? Uh, so it's it's next to that. It's actually at the Salt House Gallery, which is one that which yeah, is, I know. we have rented out. Be, yeah, yeah, Livingston will manage it, but it's, so, but it's not at their gallery. And that one goes until, I believe, the 12th of May. Great. I think I'm coming down in May. I'll just have to check my diary. But if I obviously I I'll come down with... a good five weeks or so of, yeah. it, of it on display in St. Ives. Right. Yeah, and and one of our student groups um, exhibited works in Salt House. Uh, we, we just hired yeah. it. So, yeah. Anyway, how many little galleries there are in St. Ives? <laughs> it's incredible. It's incredible. So, any list, anyone listening, do try and, you know, if you want a lovely, like, long weekend, go down to St. Ives and see that show from 6th of April, 7th of April onwards. Um, and Jack, it's been really lovely having you as a guest today. I, I just Perfect. was so good at just talking about your work. Um, and um, I hope hope to come down and see it uh, later yeah. in the year. So thank you very much for being a guest. Yeah. That's a pleasure.